John McKin. His name's Michael. Michael, there's Jeffrey for you. Hey, we good. Train spotting. Train spotting. But be careful. Keep off railway lines and be home for your tea. Hey, just a minute. Here. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Mrs. Green. Yeah, when does your car? Alright then. There's a train coming. It's B1. Six one oh oh one one. There goes Buzzer, and that'll be going down pit. There's a train coming. It's a block five for it. Let's give the train driver a wave. Four, four, six, nine, six. Do you want to spice? What are they? Tiger nuts. Please. There's a train coming. It's a street. Six oh 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 eight. New combine. I've not copied my numbers over yet. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Well, the train spotters have all gone. Oh, there's a train coming. I wonder if I dare wave. I enjoyed that. I'm sitting here on the site of the old Lofthouse Colliery, now a nature reserve and a park. Of course, mining has been going on in this area, oh, since the 1300s. But in those days, the pits were small shafts of 20 feet, or a drift worked into the hill. These were released by the Lord of the Manor, who held all the mineral rights for the area. In those early days, you could lease a pit for as little as six or seven pounds. 
but the prices rose until in the 1750s the cost would probably be £500. The extensive mining that took place was in the early 19th century when the Fentons from Hunslet came over and built about nearly a dozen pits or day holes and they employed 10 men to each pit. Later on in the 19th century, Lofthouse Colliery was sunk by the Leeds and Yorkshire Cooperative Coal Mining Company Limited who held the land on a 31 year lease. They later changed the name to Lofthouse Colliery Limited. 1947 saw the nationalisation of Britain's coal industry. This resulted in improvements to working conditions such as pit head baths, free tools and explosives that formerly had to be paid for by the miners themselves. On March 21st, 1973, seven miners were trapped in Lofthouse Colliery when the seam they were working on became flooded. A rescue mission went on for six days. One body was recovered, but six were left behind. A memorial garden, including a seven-sided stone obelisk, listing the names of the seven miners, was erected in Renthorpe, above the point where the miners were trapped. It is on the south side of Batley Road, opposite the junction with Renthorpe Lane. Lofthouse Colliery was never the same again after the disaster and closed in 1981. Miners and other employees were offered work at the new Selby Coalfield. Outwood Community Video organised a guided walk around the old Lofthouse Colliery site for a group of old miners, numbering about 20 in total. After the walk, all the miners were in up in arms because there was no evidence at all of what was Lofthouse Colliery. A working party of Lofthouse Colliery Action Group, Outward Community Video and Wakefield District Council formed a project group and in September 2012 submitted an application to the Lottery Heritage Fund and in January 2013 were successfully awarded £47,000 to carry out the project.
The first part of the project involved the creation of a permanent memorial to the colliery situated at the side of the London Leeds main line. It comprised a four metre high obelisk and a large five ton mine car. Because the old colliery site is now a country park, access to some parts of it were limited. Some of the money from the project was used to create 450 metres of new paths to reach the memorial and to reach the shaft sites, which were located by GPS.
Only one more Barry Milan and we'll be full. Another part of the project was the creation of a heritage trail. Anybody with a, an iPhone or a similar device can download a free app and click on an icon at the entrance to the park and as they're walking around the park an old miner will appear on the screen giving a description of what he did, where he did it and there are 13 of these around the site. I started work for the Coal Board in 1965. I finished in 1973. I was the first female to work full time in the offices and my job was as a contometer operator and that was the machines that came out before the, the computers. Uh, my job was to work the timesheets out for the miners. When I was a child we lived quite near Loft House Colliery so um, we used to go over what they called the cuckoo steps which led to the path that the miners took into the pit yard. So we used to go over the cuckoo steps down the path and we used to play in the pit yard. Um, no thought of health and safety in the, those days. Little did I know that uh, in 1957 I would, be, I would be working there. There were air shaft, that was material and coal shaft. B shaft, what men, riding, uh, up and down, nobody else, just men. And there were a shaft at Renthorpe. And my God, that was an experience, well, that, that winding there. That was like a, a, a toy. Because <laughs> you had to use your feet, put pedals there, for your brakes and everything. And if you didn't get to the landing, my God, you had to stand, I mean, jump on these pedals to, to, to brake. Well, in the olden days, there used to be screens where it she the shekers and they used to distribute different size coal. Uh, there were coal for steam trains, there were coal for uh, boilers for hospitals and that. It, that was a better coal. Then they were all muck and what we call small stuff went to power stations. But there was always a demand for uh, coal from loft house because it was good quality. It was silks and seam, I believe, in them days. And they were real lumps of coal, uh, you know, about four foot, four inch square, and the uh, they, they were always demand for that for the trains and for, for the uh, home coal, as they called it. My first day underground, I went in what they call Old Flockton, which were a seam what were virtually finishing, and there were retreat faces, and. Uh, the roadways were just six foot bars and, and across between the bars were split bars, wooden split bars. And I'm walking up this roadway with uh, the guy who I'd been put with, Larry Steeples, and looking at these wooden props and split bars, all broken and creaking and banging, believe you me, I was frightened to death. I started at Loft House Pit in 1949 just after Easter holidays. Started in the fitting shop. Then I went up with Cliff Morton into Powerhouse to, for maintenance at Powerhouse. <coughs> Eventually I came back into the fitting shop and went to the bloke, bloke called Jeff Walker for a while. And then <coughs> after a while, I think I'd served my time, I was 21, I went and I was uh, maintenance managed screen with Billy Lee and Jack Wood. And uh, from then on, after that, I went down pits in five years after, when I was 25 years old. That would be 59 when I went down the pit. And uh, that's about it. I started at Loft House Pit in 1956. I started it during the shop, but uh, I went in long because Colin Fadder started and the one enough work for two apprentices. So I, I went in, up into wagging shops and worked with a bloke called Tommy Spencer. And I worked up there probably six, 
for seven months and then I went into a welding shop and John Groves was my foreman, first foreman. And I worked there, in there till, oh no, I, I worked in there while I was about 19 and then I went down pit, a big mistake. And I worked down pit for probably 18 months at most and uh, there were a lot on holiday at welding shop and they sent for me back out and I, for two weeks. Anyway, I managed to wandle two months out of it and Sid Bennett saw me and said, what, what are you doing out here? I said, well, nobody's told me to go back. He said, well, back down Peter Monday at the open bar. So I went to see Bernard Ney, engineer. I said, I don't, I have to go back down Peter Bernard. I said, no, I don't want to go. He says, do you want to come back at Welling Shop? I says, yeah. So he says, I'll go see Mr. Mapplebeck. So he come back, he says, ah, you're all right, you didn't stop out at Pitt. He says, but, he says, he'll never let you go down again. I says, it'll do for me, will that? Well, it was some right characters at Lofty House. I remember my first day there, uh, I think they called him Shepherd, the training instructor, were taking us into the fitting shop, and I looked at him and I says, when do you have your lunch? He says, it ain't lunch here, lad, it's snap. <laughs> And then I went, we'd all to go wash his hands at lunchtime, or snap time as they called it. I remember going into the toilet with cold tap. I saw they had one single cold tap, cold water running out. I went last in. Didn't turn tap off like nobody else did. And my ears looked booming at me. Do you leave tap running at home? I was told to go to pit by my dad. I wanted to go to Copper Works, but really, I wanted to join Forestry Commission. But he says, you'll get more, you'll get more brass if you go to that pit. So I started at electric shop, I think about 80 electricians. They're all nice lads, all nice fellas. Uh, basically, apprentice's job was to look after the electrician, carry what he wanted, fetch, go fetch me this, go carry me that, go bring this, go bring that, drill that oil there, I'll mark that, drill that. So they didn't have to carry any gear, basically. Uh, we looked after everything, all electrical equipment on surface. We installed it, we repaired it, we maintained it. We made bits to fit if some at Brock, because they wouldn't send for a lot at the time, and half the time you had to go see fitters and they'd cut you a bit of bar and you had to drill it and make some oil to adapt to whatever you needed. Yeah, it was a really good apprenticeship scheme, I found it was brilliant. I once went to stores on a morning, I used to go for a cave, for a shop, and I put my snap bag, I went only about, I hadn't been a bit long, I put my snap bag on the counter, got caves. And I picked the snap bag up, went into the shop, only it on, oh, like, you know. When it come to snap time, I opened it. There was a bottle of water in it. And two slices of jam and bread. I thought, you didn't mind it, this. Well, I know what it's like when you first start with me. I don't, my mum put, you know, chocolate biscuits in your snap, like, you know. And, uh, uh, Bram Bennett, it was Bram Bennett, it picked my snap bag up. And I picked his up, fasketeer in the nose and biscuits and all sorts. And he was late out at pit and had to wait for him coming out. It was funny. And he said, uh, I said, that's not what I write out. Cocky said, uh, when that gets home, tell him how to put some more biscuits in. <laughs> <laughs> at strategic points around the site, interpretation panels have been installed, which give detailed description of what was located at, at that site. Things like the colliery washer, the pithead baths, the shafts, etc. Because the colliery site was open casted after the pit closed to a depth of 120 feet, the old shafts are no longer in existence. They were actually capped 120 feet below ground. In order to mark the shafts, a GPS device was used to locate them and they've been permanently marked with gabions filled with shale.
why we built these up. Right. Around the site there are a total of nine paths, none of them had a name, so it was decided to name the paths after the seams that were worked at the pit, Silkston, Blocking, Furnace, Flockton etc. At the culmination of the project, an opening ceremony was performed by Chris Skidmore, the Yorkshire President of the National Union of Mine Workers. A concert was held in Lofthouse Gate Working Men's Club. During the concert, Kipax Brass Band played seven jolly miners and Mr Neild, an old actor from Lancashire who performed a soliloquy about a Christmas carol.
hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully, the Lord's on our side. I'd like to declare, Moscow's Hope is real, well and truly open to the complete chapter in the history of Lofthouse Colliery. We've all come here this morning for this official opening and dedication of this Heritage Trail and this wonderful monument, the Heritage Trail through Lofthouse Colliery Nature Park. We sing the hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. <laughs> blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
you for inviting me here this morning to take part in the unveiling ceremony to mark our country's mining history and heritage. Obviously today marks another chapter in Lofthouse College's life and times from 1873 to the present day. Uh, I should say that tribute should be made to the Outwood Community Video Group, the Lofthouse College Action Group, along with the local council for devoting so much time and energy into ensuring that the colliery site still has a, a role to play in the local community, even though it was shut by the Coal Board in 18, 1981. Uh, the Heritage Trail is also a tribute to Fred, Colin, Frank, Sydney, Charles, Edward and Alan who died in the disaster of 1973, but also to all the other miners who lived and died working at Lofthouse Colliery. I'd like to thank Chris on the behalf of Lofthouse Colliery Action Group and, and, and Outward Community Video and Wakefield NDC. I'd like to give him as a thank you from all of us this figurine that is carved from coal, I tell a lie, made from coal, made with coal, so on our behalf, Chris, please accept this. It's called End of an Era. I've got another couple of presentations to make. Uh, the first one is to Mr. Tony Banks. It's called Chums. I know this is going to embarrass her, really, but Sue's our countryside officer, and a lot of the work that's been done on this project is down to Sue. She's had a personal tragedy and she is doing stuff above and beyond. So please accept that. Last night, I. Oh, I say, boy, what's today? Today, it's Christmas Day. If Christmas Day, then I have missed it after all. Oh, a Merry Christmas, Scrooge. A Merry Christmas to everybody. Now then, what can I do to celebrate this wonderful Christmas? I haven't celebrated it since I was a boy. Oh, now let me think. I know, I know. I'll write a cheque for the Desi Troupeau and send it to that gentleman that called here yesterday. Yes, that would be a good beginning. And then to spend. Oh Lord, where can I go? No one will want Scrooge. No one. Yes, there is one. My old clerk Bob Cratchit, poor old Bob with his 15. Mm. Did anyone hear you say 15 shillings? Mm. Well, I'll begin by doubling it. Mm. Now, <coughs> oh, I know. I say, boy, do you know the poachers at the corner? Bravo. Run down and see if they sold that big prize turkey. What, the one as big as me? Yes, that's the one, my boy. Run down and order it for Ebenezer Scrooge and I'll give you a half crown for yourself. The uh, same old railings. Ah, uh, they were built to last in them days. Mick, uh, I mean Michael, it's a few years since we stood here. I about 60. I've still got my Rothwell Grammar School cap and my train spotting book. And I've got my combine and my snake belt. And you can still buy them tiger nuts. Shall, Shall we? we? 